In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Our Bible study tonight from uh, Psalm 78. The title of this psalm, A Contemplation of Asaph. So the author is Asaph, and Asaph was a great singer and musician during the reign of David and Solomon. Also, in 2 Chronicles chapter 29 and verse 30, we read that Asaph was a prophet in his musical composition. So, in composing the music and the tunes of the psalm, it carries actually prophecies about, you know, the economy of God. This psalm, Psalm 78, is the longest of the historical psalms. Historical psalms, the psalms that mention the history of Israel. So this psalm actually is the longest of historical psalms. And is the second longest psalm after Psalm 119. Psalm 119, which is 22 uh, passages, each passage is 8 verses, is the longest psalm in the book of Psalms. The second longest psalm is Psalm 78. It is 72 verses. 72 verses. Also, Psalm 78 is classified as a historical psalm, as I told you, because it tells the history of Israel. Um, from the time uh, of their, uh, their, they were in Egypt until the reign of King David. It is the, a historical psalm, but it did not record the history just for the sake of history. But it recorded to us the history for a lesson. So what the psalmist shows throughout the psalm is God's faithfulness to the people in spite of the unfaithfulness of God. We will see during this psalm, in the whole psalm, that the people rebelled against God, but God remained faithful to them. So, Asaph shows that the repeated rebellion of the Israelites was also due to their inability to remember God and His wondrous works with Him. So the first lesson, God is faithful, even if we are unfaithful. Second lesson, the repeated rebellion can be because of our inability to remember the works of God with us. The third lesson, the need to remember and not to forget, is the theme that runs throughout the psalm. Usually when we say history, many people actually, when they mention the history, they mention the history to celebrate heroic ancestor, for example, or to exalt national honor. But we find exactly the opposite in Psalm 78. The Psalm does not tell us the story of the past with any views of celebrating heroic ancestors, heroes, of the past, or exalting national honor. Rather, it is a long confession of national feeling. A long confession of national feeling. So, Asaph invites all of us to draw a lesson of warning for ourselves from the past history of Israel. So, let us learn from the mistake of our ancestors. The psalmist holds up the picture to his generation in hope that they may learn to avoid the repeating of the sins of their forefathers. So the first theme, God remain faithful if we are unfaithful. Second theme, in a, the rebellion or the repeated rebellion because inability to remember the good works of God. 
The third lesson, how to learn from the shortcoming of our forefathers. The fourth lesson is that each generation has a responsibility to teach the next generation about the works and words of God. So there are four lessons in this psalm. God remains faithful even if we are unfaithful. If we forget the words of God, this leads to rebellion. We need to learn from the mistakes of our forefathers. And also, uh, we have a responsibility to teach the next generation about the words and words of God. When the psalm was written, it is difficult to determine. However, since it recorded from the time of Israel in Egypt until the reign of King David, then the history uh, goes as far as when David began to lead Israel. That's why we can say it is written during the reign of David or possibly shortly after the departure of David. As I told you, it is 72 verses. From verse 1 to 8, teach the generation, as I told you, this one of the four themes. 9 to 42, Israel in wilderness. 43 to 51, the plagues which he God brought upon the Egyptians. 52 to 58, the deliverance and repeated disobedience of Israel. 59 to 64, their punishment. 65 and 66, God's wrath against their adversary. 70, 67 to 72, the establishment of the king, kingdom of God. <laughs> Hopefully I can finish this song over four weeks. So let's try to finish 18 verse each week. So 18 by 4 is 72. So let's start by, by verse 1. Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old. Asaph begins the psalm by declaring the need to teach, incline your ear. Psalm 78 is a wisdom psalm. Yes, it is a historical psalm, but a wisdom psalm. Written with one purpose to instruct and to teach the people of God. Since the theme is the goodness and kindness of God, the faithfulness of God, to his stubborn people, to his unfaithful people and rebellious people. Asaph began by asking for attention of God's people. Pay attention, listen to me. His first task is to get the attention of those whom he would address so they could hear the wisdom he would speak. So he orders the people of God to give ear, to incline their ears both imperative verbs to incline the ear actually sometimes in the book of psalm we say to god incline your ear or sometimes we say to one another incline your ear when we say it to god it's different than i say it to the people so to incline the ear when applied to people means hear me with humility and obedience but when it applied to god means god hear me with compassion and mercy so when i say to god incline your ear to me i am asking god to incline his ear to listen to me with compassion and mercy but if i say to the people incline your ear means listen to me with humility and obedience so asaf is saying incline your ears as a disciple does to the words of his master with submission and humility silent and sincere that whatever is uttered for the purpose of instruction may be heard 
and properly understood. A self request from his people to incline their ears to the words of his mouth, counting every word coming from his mouth as conforming to the law of the Lord. So, as if they conform to the law of the Lord, they listen because now the Holy Spirit, by inspiration, is speaking on a self mouth. Some asked, who is the speaker here? And give ear to my people. Who is the speaker? Actually, you have different answers. For example, some Augustine said it is God the Father. Some Athanasius, Saint Jerome, and several others said it is God the Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Other commentators said it is Asaph himself or King David. For those who believe the speaker in verse 1 and 2 is our Lord Jesus Christ, their justification is Jesus is the son of David, according to the flesh. And now he's addressing his people whom he called from the Gentiles. Why from the Gentiles? Because in the Old Testament, the Gentiles were rejected. But in the New Testament, they are called my people, as we read in Romans chapter 9, verse 25, and which is a quote from Hosea, as he says also in Hosea, I will call them the Gentiles my people, who were not in the Old Covenant, not my people. And I will call them the, the Gentiles beloved, who was not in the Old Covenant beloved. He presented to his people his law. Jesus Christ presented his law and the word of his mouth. He talks to them mouth to mouth. But those who believe the speaker here is David, they say that not only the kings or the rulers or the prophets or the apostles feel the people of God are their people. But every single believer feels that the people of God are his people. They refer them to himself and himself to the people of God. Let me give you an example. Ruth. Ruth the Gentile. She became a believer. So she said to her mother-in-law, Naomi, your people shall be my people. So... It is either Jesus Christ who is calling us my people or King David say my people because he is a king or even as a part of the family of God I can refer to the rest of the family of God my people as Ruth said about the believers my people, your people shall be my people. Another example in the book of Judges, chapter 12, verse 2, Jephthah said to the men of Ephraim, My people and I were in a great struggle with the people of Amun, and when I called you, you did not deliver me out of their hands. So he called the believers my people. Another uh, example in First Chronicle 28 verse 2 talking about his longing to build the house of the Lord David says hear me my brethren and my people so the psalmist counts Asaph counts God's law also as his law referring the law of God to himself being a personal message presented from God to the believer that's why even the Apostle St. Paul said about the Gospel, my Gospel. Because Asaph, when he said, hear my law, give ear all my people to my law. My law is not law set by Asaph, but it is the law of God. But why Asaph is calling the law of God his law? Because he received the law of God as a personal message to him. So it became his law. As St. Paul referred to the gospel in Romans chapter 2, verse 16, my gospel. 
Asaf proclaims his great love for the divine commandments, cherishes it, and refers the commandment of God to himself as a gift from God to him. So now the commandments are his own to acquire for himself, to live it with his complete free will. That's why he called the law of God my law. It, now it's my law. Why the psalmist asked the people to give attention, to pay attention? The reason why the psalmist asked that what he says, because what he says may be listened to with attention and humility, because he's about to say difficult and dark and mysterious matters that require attention and humility. That what he said in verse 2, I will open my mouth in a parable, I will utter dark sayings of old. Dark means difficult, saying of old, so it needs attention. He said parable and dark uh, saying or difficult saying. Parable can come with two meanings. The first meaning of parable in the Bible in general, understood as proverb or metaphor that are usually short and figurative. But like in Matthew chapter 13, parable, as we know from the teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ, is a story which contains symbols and analogies which convey a deeper meaning than the story at the surface, like the parable of the sower, for example. So, when we read the word parable in the scripture, can be a story, like the parables of the Lord Jesus Christ, or can be just a proverb or metaphor that's short and figurative, method. Often parables are meant to be applied to our own lives in some way. And parables give a deeper insight into truth and doctrines of God. So he's saying to them, listen because I will say parables and dark saying, difficult saying, since they contain symbols and analogies, cannot be fully understood without study and meditation. Yes, they are very plain to the humble. They are very easy if people took them with humbleness, uh, the, the diligent and the obedient seeker, they, they will found the parable of dark saying plain. Especially for those who pray that the Holy Spirit may enlighten their mind and teach them. Asaph teaches us in this psalm that the history of Israel, the whole history of Israel, is just a parable, a story, a parable from which we can explore deeper meaning and uncover hidden things. And St. Paul agrees with Asaph. Because St. Paul, when he spoke about the history of Israel in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, he said, now all these things happened to them, to Israel, as examples, as parables. And they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Also in Matthew 13, verse 35, quotes from Psalm 78, verse 2. When the Lord Jesus Christ said all these things, Jesus spoke to the multitude in parables. And without a parable, he did not speak to them that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet saying where it was mentioned in psalm 78 verse 2 i will open my mouth in parables i will utter things keep secret from the foundation of the world this translation is according to the situation but this is verse 2 from psalm 78 i will open my mouth in parables I will utter things instead of saying, I will utter dark things of all days. He said, I will utter things kept secret from the foundation of the world. That's according to Septuagint. So, what was quoted in Matthew 17, 35 is Psalm 78, verse 2. So, the psalmist 
has no mere narrative of facts to recount. He is not just saying facts, historical facts. But a history full of significance has meaning and lessons for those who can grasp its hidden meaning. So when we read the history in general, in scripture, it's not just history, it's not facts. It's not just Israel went to Egypt, uh, Exodus from Egypt, uh, splitting the Red Sea. There is a deeper meaning. That's why he said, I will utter dark sayings of old. He would bring out and apply to the present case the saying and the truth of all the wisdom. Verse 3. These sayings which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us. So Asaf will not bring up new things for discussion, but things already within the mind of Israel. They still remember it. Being about to write a history of matters that had within them mysteries hidden from the beginning of the world, he tells us he got the history of these from the fathers who got them from their ancestors. So while he is saying that I will mention things of the old, from where he got them, he said, and our fathers have told us. And how? The, his father got this information from their ancestors, and so on. So the fact of their past history had been how, handed down orally from father to son among Israel, not simply learned it from secret writing. So he did not only learn this from like the five books of Moses but also from oral tradition. In the same way, the fact of Christianity has reached us not only through the New Testament, but also through the teaching of the church tradition and fathers of the church. Receiving the truth from the lips of others put the instructed believer under grave obligation to pass on the truth to the next generation. If I receive the teaching from my fathers, then I am obligated to pass it to the next generation. As we read in verse 4. And by the way, I told you this one of the four themes of this psalm. We will not hide them from their children, telling the, to, to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and His strength and His wonderful works that he has done three things from generation to generation we will tell praises of the Lord his strengths his wonderful works that he has done so we have a responsibility not to hide what we learned from our ch children and our children should hand it down to their children and so on. So the psalmist knew that what they had received, they had to pass on to the next generation, telling to the generation to come the praises of the Lord. Asaph knew what followed in this psalm come from events and themes received from the fathers. And he emphasized that the strength and wonderful works of God is to be told, not the strength and wonderful work of the people. So, when we share from generation to generation, we need to share the praises of the Lord, the strength of the Lord, wonderful works of the Lord, not our wonderful works, or people's wonderful works, or the strength of the people. So it's clear from verse 4 that Asaph was concerned about passing on at least three things to the next generation. The presence of the Lord, meaning to teach the next generation that God is worthy of our adoration and gratitude. Number two, God's strength. We need to teach the next generation the power and greatness of God 
which is above and beyond the all. Third thing, his wonderful words. We need to teach next generation God's power and greatness in active assistance to his people. Throughout the Old Testament, the people of God are told that they have a responsibility not only to remember for themselves the wonderful words of God, but to tell the next generation about what God has done and what God has said. The works and the words of the Lord. What God has done and what God has said. What is the purpose of teaching next generation? To produce hope and trust in God and to protect them from sin and rebellion. Because <coughs> if one generation failed to pass along their faith and their stories behind their faith to the next generation, then the chain will be broken and faith likely will be lost forever. Even right now, in our contemporary time, Although the written scripture are easily attainable, but it is still necessary that the works and doctrine of God be transmitted orally from generation to generation to establish reference for God in the family and to witness to the next generation the goodness of God in our lives. Now, from verse uh, 5, using poetic repetition of style and emphasis, Asaf began by describing one of the greatest of God's wonderful words, which is giving the word of God to Israel, as he heard from the fathers, how God gave his commandment to Moses and so on. Verse 5, he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children. So he places first the fact that God gave the people of Israel the law and the commandment through Moses. And he ordered them that the law must be given by parent to the children and to be handed down to future generations. That they should make them known to their children. And here I, I just, I, I will pause. Do we teach to our children the word of God or not? So, centuries later, St. Paul would explain that one of the greatest advantages God gave to Israel, that he committed to Israel his word, the oracles of God, as we read in Romans chapter 3, verse 2. He established a testimony. Why call the law of God or the commandment of God testimony? Because the law of God testifies of the will of God toward us. According to Onesimus, Bishop of Jerusalem, God presented to his people his law, the tabernacle, the Ark of Covenant, all these as a testimony to keep to his covenant. But in the Old Testament, when they broke this covenant, then in the New Covenant, he actually presented to us the body and the blood of his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, as a living testimony in the church. Take drink, this is my blood of the new covenant. So the blood of Jesus and his body are living testimony in the church. So not only should our children be taught, but they should be taught to teach their children. So we need to teach our children that it is their responsibility to teach their children 
so that the word and the work of God will continue throughout the generation. St. John Chrysostom considered the role of the parents in raising their children a holy work. So raising your children is a holy work. Practiced by parents to present to God sacrifices of thanksgiving and the subject of his pleasure. So, in order to express our thanksgiving to God, go and teach your children the praises of God. St. John Chrysostom said, Never deem it an unnecessary thing that he should be a diligent hearer of the divine scripture. Speak about your children. So he said, it is a very necessary thing for your son or daughter to be a diligent hearer of the divine scripture. For there the first thing he hears, your, your son or daughter hears, will be this, honor your father and your mother. So that this mix of you, never say this is a business of the monks. Don't say, no, monks should study the scripture, not my children. Am I making a monk of him? Don't say, am I making a monk of my son or daughter? No. There is no need he should become a monk. Why be so afraid of a thing so replete with so much advantage? So St. John is saying, why are you afraid to teach your children the word of God, which actually has so much advantage? Make him a Christian. By teaching him the word of God, you are not making him a monk, but you are making him a true Christian, a true believer. So, he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he, God, commanded our fathers that they should make them, make the commandments known to their children that the generation to come, our children, might know them, and the children who would be born, their children, that they may arise and declare them to their children. So from generation to generation. What is the purpose of all of this? That they may set their hope in God. That's the purpose. When I, they learn about the wonderful works of God, they will trust God, that they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. So in verse 7 and 8, explain why God gave the law to his people and he ordered the parents to teach it to the children and the children to hand it down to future generations. It is to make them to put no trust in false gods or idols of the Gentiles, but to learn to trust God for themselves and also never forget his wonderful works. To trust alone in the true God who gave them a holy law from heaven accompanied by great signs, that they should not forget God's wonderful doing in delivering them from the bondage of Satan, which Actually, as an example, the bondage of fear. Furthermore, that they should seek to know and diligently put into practice God's command. So there are three reasons why we should teach our children. To trust in God, not to forget His wonderful works, and also to put to practice God's commandment in our life. What will happen if they forgot the law of God and forgot his wonderful work? Verse 8, And may not be like their fathers, the Israelites, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not set its heart aright and whose spirit was not faithful to God. So, losing trust in God and forgetting his words would lead to disobedience. So if the younger generation is well instructed, 
they would be more likely to be obedient, avoiding many of the errors of their fathers. They should not imitate the ungratefulness and the unfaithfulness of their fathers, who after all the favors granted to them by God through Moses, proved the most ungrateful and unfaithful to God. For example, while they were in Egypt, they could hardly be brought to trust Moses. And after having left Egypt, Several times they rebelled against Moses and against God. They were murmuring, grumbling, worshipping the golden calf. They were stubborn and rebellious. They did not set their heart aright, and their spirit was not faithful to God. So, Asaph here was focusing on the heart. Their heart is not aright, and their attitude. They were not grateful. They were not faithful to God. And according to St. Jerome, the generation that came out of Egypt bore four features. Loss of God, blasphemy of the Creator, resistance and rebellion, rejecting of and not receiving the work of the Spirit of God in them. These are the four characteristics of the Israelites who came out of Egypt. Verse 9. The children of Ephraim, being armed and carrying bows, turned back in the day of battle. They did not keep the covenant of God. They refused to walk in His law. So, from verse 1 to 8, Asaph introduced that the history of Israel is a parable. The parable that Asaf is to explain is the parable of the history of the children of Israel. And by calling this history a parable, we learn that we should meditate on this history and consider what we can learn from the actions, the words, and the behavior of the children of Israel. And we should apply these lessons to our own lives as we seek to apply to our life the lesson that Jesus taught us from the parables, like in Matthew chapter 13. Now from verse 9, the historical part of the psalm begins with some general remarks on the transgression of Ephraim. In verse 9 to the rest of the psalm, verse 72, the psalmist details the history of the nation of Israel from Zuan, Suan, Egypt, to Zion, Jerusalem. The retelling emphasizes both the faithfulness of God and the forgetfulness of people. As I told you, one of the themes, God remained faithful even if one faithful. And the tribe of Ephra, Ephraim was one of the larger and stronger tribes of Israel. That's why many times God referred to whole Israel as Ephraim. For example, in 2 Chronicles chapter 25, verse 7, God used the phrase children of Ephraim to refer to the people of Israel as a whole. So, in verse 9, when he says the children of Ephraim, he's referring to Israel as a whole. Children of Ephraim were defeated in war. Why? Why they were defeated in war? Why many times Israel was defeated in war? For not keeping the covenant of God, nor walking according to the divine commandments, but forgetting God's works and wonders. As he said, the children of Ephraim, being armed and carrying both. So they have the weapons, but they turn it back in the day of battle. Why? They did not keep the covenant of God. They refused to walk in his law. So it is figuratively speak to mean that the Ephraimites were like cowards who flee in battle and fail to fight. 
for the cause of God. How to apply this? Take this as a spiritual battle in our battle with uh, Satan. God equipped Israel for the battle. He gives them arms and bows. Yet they often failed in the day of battle because they did not keep the covenant of God. In the same way, we have the whole armor of God, the helmet of salvation, breastplate of faith, etc. Although we have the whole armor of God, but many times we are defeated because we don't keep the covenant of God. God makes to us spiritual resources available to his people for a spiritual conflict they may face. The armor of God, Ephesians chapter 6. However, the effectiveness of these weapons, spiritual weapons, depend in some regard on their decision and how to make use of them. Are we trusting God? Are we walking in his law or not? Israel, they refused to walk in his law and they forgot his words and his wonders. So disobedience and ignorance among God's people were examples of being turned back in the day of battle. If I'm defeated spiritually, maybe because I refuse to walk in the law of God or I, I forget his words and his wonders in my life. They forgot God's kindness to them the wonderful works he did for them in Egypt, which had been related to them by their fathers. Their father told them about what God did them. So this being a parable, exam, a story to learn from, we can learn about the effects of disobedience and a lack of faith due to not remembering the goodness and power of God. We will be defeated in our spiritual warfare. So this is a warning to all generations. The spiritual battle may be lost if we are disobedient and forgetful. Forgetfulness of God is a sin and is a source of innumerable inequities. Such forgetfulness leads to disobedience and weakens our faith. Then disobedience and lack of faith directly lead to our defeat in a spiritual battle. Verse 11. And forgot his works and his wonders that he had shown them. They forgot. Marvelous things he did in the sight of their fathers, in the land of Egypt, in the field of Zuan. Suan or Zuan, known to the Greeks as Tanis, was situated on the east bank of what was formerly called the Tanitic branch of the Nile. This was the capital of Hyksos dynasty and was refounded by Ramses II. So, marvelous things he did in the sight of their fathers in the land of Egypt in the field of Zohar to show that the wonderful things done by Moses were not done in a corner, but in the most public place, in the king palace, in the capital. Having touched upon the wonderful things that were done in Egypt before Pharaoh, now from verse 13 he described the other miracles that were performed in the departure of the Israelites. He divided the sea and caused them to pass through, and he made the waters stand up like a heap. In the daytime, also he led them with a cloud, and all the night with a light of fire. So, as Pharaoh's armies pursued Israel, God miraculously brought the people through the sea on dry land as God made the waters stand up like a heap. St. Augustine says he divided the sea in order that the water might stand up first as if it were shut in. Is able by his grace to restrain 
Yeah, that is the application in our life. So St. Augustine said, God is able by his grace to restrain the flowing and ebbing tides of carnal lusts. When we renounce this world, so that all sins having been thoroughly washed away as if they were enemies, the people of the faithful may be made to pass through by means of the sacrament of baptism. So he's saying, Pharaoh and his soldier represent the lusts, the carnal lusts. And as Pharaoh and his soldiers actually drowned in the water of the Red Sea, in the same way when we believe in God and we are baptized, the carnal lusts are drowned in the water of baptism. And what is the second baptism? Repentance. So after we are baptized, then in the tears of repentance, the carnal lusts will be drowned and washed away. God miraculously guided them through the wilderness. He miraculously provided for them in the wilderness. When the Israelites came in the wilderness of Sinai, God assured them and guided them with two demonstrations of his presence. The cloud in the day and fire by night. Often in the wilderness, the nation of Israel needed water. And many times God miraculously provided water. One occasion was at Mariba, where Moses struck the rock and the rock split, bringing forth water. That's why we read in verse 15, he split rocks like Mariba in the wilderness and gave them drink in the abundance like the depth. He also brought streams out of the rock and caused waters to run down like rivers. God guided them by cloud in the day and fire by night. St. Augustine has a beautiful uh, reflection on this. He said, Jesus Christ our Lord, in his incarnation, as if in cloud. But in the judgment day, he will be manifested in terror by the night. For then there will be a great tribulation of the world, as it were fire, and it shall shine for the just, but this fire shall burn the unjust. So the cloud represents the incarnation, and the fire represents the second coming, judgment. The fire shines to the righteous and burns the unrighteous. In verse 16, he spoke about streams out of rock. He brought streams out of rock. So, uh, is surely able upon thirsty faith to pour the gift of the Holy Spirit. To pour, that was St. Augustine saying, as if from spiritual rock, the spiritual rock is Christ. As we read in the letter of St. Paul, spiritual rock that follows them is Christ. Christ is stand, is, is stood and cried, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me. And that, and he that shall have drunk of the water which I shall give, rivers of living water shall flow out of his bosom. So, verse 16, he also brought streams out of the rock. This rock is Christ. The streams are the Holy Spirit. As the Lord said, streams of living water come from his bosom and caused water to run down like rivers. Verse 17, but they sinned. After all these wonderful things, they sin even more against him by rebelling against the Most High in the wilderness. God repeatedly did great and amazing things for Israel in taking the people out of Egypt and preserving them in the wilderness. Yet Israel's response was to sin even more and to rebel against the Most High. So, in spite of these miracles of mercy, they sinned yet more and tempted God in their unbelief. So that while he supplied for their needs, 
God was compelled to punish them for their sin. Sin more means there is additional sin. So what is the additional sin? The main sin is rebellion. But what is the additional sin? St. Augustine said the additional sin is their unbelief. Wherefore it is said that they provoked God in drought. Because though their bodies drank of the water from the rock, but their mind remained thirsty and dry of all spiritual grace. So when we read in, in verse 17, but they sinned even more, even more the first sin is rebellion, more is the unbelief. By rebelling against the Most High in the wilderness. So despite the work of God in their life, despite his miraculous protection and providence, the children of Israel not only continued to sin and, sin and rebel, but they went further and willfully put God to test. They tested God in their heart by asking for the food of their fancy. So, two words sum up Israel's behavior. Rebellion, they rebelled against God by constant disobedience to his revealed will. And the second word, temptation. They tempted God, they tested God. By disbelieving doubts of his goodness and the impudent, disrespectful demands that he should prove his power. Meaning what? What, what does it mean, don't test the Lord? When as if you are challenging God, can God do this? Can God provide meat in the wilderness? Can God bring water out of this rock? So that's testing God, when as if I'm challenging God. God gave them the manna, but they soon wanted meat. They wanted the food for their fence. They were dissatisfied with what God provided the manna. They thought, the reason why God did not give them meat, what they wanted, was because God, he could not. It was beyond his power. That's why he said, can God give us meat in the wilderness? That is testing God. So, as I told you, we'll stop at verse 18. So, this will be the end of our Bible study tonight. Glory be to God forever.